my name is Jeremy Marvin. Uh, I am a, an application engineer here at CATI in the Cincinnati office, uh, working for the manufacturing solutions team. So uh, I'm a pre-sales resource for the sales team. We do webinars, we do blog posts, uh, and a lot of the trainings and that sort of thing. Um, so a little bit of our agenda today, uh, I do want to step back a little bit and, and just not assume that everybody knows everything I'm going to talk about as far as the history of our, our printing goes. Uh, so I want to take the time to go over FDM and polyjet technology. So I do, I do want to step through the technologies, how they work, the machines, and a couple uh, material highlights. Uh, I will step into the digital anatomy printer and same sort of thing. We'll go over, over the machine, the materials, uh, the software workflow, and a, and a couple applications. Um, at the end of that, I want to include a few more medical applications if we have time, uh, not necessarily related to the digital anatomy printer, but uh, any of the printing technologies and any materials. So um, I'll, I'll cap that on at the end. All right, just to, just to get going, uh, the first printer technology that we want to look at is fused deposition modeling, or FDM. Um, FDM was invented back in the late 80s, early 90s, and is one of the most common methods of 3D printing today, um, both for industrial use as well as the hobbyist. Uh, FDM takes a heated thermoplastic filament and extrudes it layer by layer to create a three-dimensional part. Stratasys printers will use two print heads or two extrusers. Um, one for a model material and one for a support material. Um, anytime we want to print in thin air or we have any overhangs, we're going to have that support material. Uh, and for most of these printers or most of these um, uh, industrial FDM printers, the support structure is going to be something that can dissolve away. It'll be water soluble. Uh, some of the, the uh, certified ones will require a a manual support removal. So think about just pulling off with pliers or, or maybe breaking them off by hand. Uh, this software does a few different things to make that easier. Uh, and that is to keep its medical certification if it has that. Uh, so we want to keep them out of the, the hot water bath. Yeah. So looking at the FDM portfolio, we have a wide range of available materials, a, a wide range of printers that those go on. Uh, everything from a desktop unit with a 10 by 10 by 10 build envelope all the way up to a Stratasys F900, uh, which is one of the largest uh, enclosed machine FDM printers available today, as far as I know. And that's like a, that's a 36 by 24 by 36 build envelope. So very impressive on the on the part build size. As far as the materials available, uh, starting at the bottom and working our way up, we have uh, elastomers, thermoplastic elastomers, and TPU 92A. It's a Shore A92 thermoplastic elastomer, so kind of a flexible rubbery material. We have from that standard plastics, ABS. Uh, ABSI is one that we'll look at here in a little bit. It's one of the uh, entry level medical grade uh, plastics we'll have. Uh, stepping up from that, we have polycarbonate, a PC ISO some nylons. Uh, another step up from that, we have our high-performance FDM materials. These are Altum, um, Altum 1010, 9085, a carbon-filled nylon, and Antero, which is a, a PEC-based uh, thermoplastic, PEKK. And at the top, we have some specialty, so uh, certified grades. We have medical grade. We have aerospace certifi certified ones. We can do special colors, and then uh, a sacrificial tooling material that we'll throw into that special category as well. And those for, are for doing um, carbon fiber layups where we'll uh, dissolve the mandrel away from a hollow part. All right, so just a couple of the FDM materials I wanted to touch on is ABSI, uh, and we'll touch on uh, PC ISO. They're, they're both um, just like their, their non-certified counterpart. They're, they have some extra additives to make them sterilizable. So they can go through gamma radiation. They can go through ETO, which is a low temp process that uses ethylene oxide gas to remove and reduce bacteria, germs, and other contaminants. So we have ABS, we have PC, which is about the same thing, uh, except it's a little bit stronger, a little higher heat resistance. And if you need the pinnacle in FDM as far as the, the materials available, uh, Altum 1010 would be your, your guy. Uh, it's the highest heat resistance and the most certification. So this one has, I believe, a medical certification to be uh, in contact with mucous me membranes and um, uh, contact with the skin. Um, what that certification number actually is, I don't recall off the top of my head. 
All right, so the second technology we're going to look at is PolyJet. Uh, and if you're not familiar with PolyJet, you, you might be more familiar with it than what you think. Uh, if you have a, a 2D printer, so one of the inkjet printers at home where you have, uh, you know, it feeds in paper, it lays down ink, it dries the ink, and then out comes a picture. In the case of PolyJet technology, we're, we're laying very thick layers of ink. It's, it's a photopolymer ink. It's a thermal set. Uh, to kick off the chemical reaction, we're going to use uh, a UV light instead of a, a chemical um, catalyst. So we're using light to catalyze the, or start that chemical reaction to, to solidify it. So we're building up very thick layers. Uh, it, it's comparing it to, to paper image printing, uh, it's thicker layers. So, you know, down to 14 microns, you know, as high as um, 30 microns, 40 microns, and some of the draft modes can go higher yet. Okay. So our PolyJet portfolio, uh, we start off with our desktop line, uh, Object 30 and 30 Prime. Uh, something new, if you guys have been watching the news and watching uh, some of the, the feeds coming off of uh, our blogs and Stratasys blogs is the Stratasys J55. Uh, this is a brand new PolyJet printer. It works a little bit differently than the rest of the printers in that the head stays stationary while it's printing and the, the uh, build tray revolves around like a, a, polar, a polar coordinate system. Um, so kind of cool on that. Uh, stepping up from there, we have our Connexes. So these are a little bit larger. Um, these will be producing easy concept models to where you wouldn't necessarily need full color. You know, the J55 is, you know, full color, full Pantone certified and all that. So you don't, if you need large parts and you don't need the color, then you can look at a Connex one. Um, if you do want to bring in the color, we have uh, three different sizes of the J8 series, the 826, 835, and 850. Uh, the same color combinations are available on both, and what you're going to get is a larger uh, build envelope. So this will depend on the, the quantity of parts and the size of your parts. Uh, stepping up, well, it's not necessarily stepping up. I think that J, the Connex 3 should be on the opposite side of the J's. So it's the same build envelopes as the J's. Uh, it's just instead of seven materials at once and blending those together, we're going to have three materials at once. And then the large one there on the end, the Object 1000, uh, can do two materials at a time. It's usually used for very, very large uh, tooling applications. So think large injection molding or or you know, that sort of thing. And then our digital anatomy printer gives its own page. Um, my guess is down the line, we'll see other build envelopes available. And then this, this, this portfolio will start building out as we move along. Um, it does have the same materials as the J7, which is the predecessor to the J8. And it has six model materials at a time. So we can blend those together in different colors, different durometers, uh, and that, that sort of thing. So a little bit on the material portfolio. Uh, the Vero family is kind of where we start off with very rigid, opaque materials. So, uh, and even the, transla the translucent ones. Uh, the flexible ones, the Tangle and Agilis are, we talked Shore A30 is where that starts out. And we can blend that up uh, to almost uh, Shore A90 or 95, I think off the top of my head. Uh, Vero Flex is a, a specialty material that was uh, a flexible, material that was uh, given the colors so we could do full colors that are slightly flexible. So it's a very specific durometer. Um, usually it would be where uh, eyeglass manufacturers might use those. So think about how flexible a set of eyeglass frames might be. Um, the medical grade, we are the medical side of things. We have, uh, you know, dental materials. We have biocompatible materials. And we, with a, the DAP or the digital anatomy printer, we have three new materials. Uh, bone matrix, tissue matrix, and gel matrix. And we'll, we'll step through what that means here in a few slides. And on the, the high end of things, we have digital ABS, which is um, the closest thing we have to like a true ABS or a true thermoplastic. Uh, it is still a thermal set, and it's just a blend together of, of uh, a high heat and a high toughness material. Um, a lot of times people use that for uh, molding, uh, injection molding and that. So just to step through a couple of the materials on the polyjet side, um, I, I want to mention Med610. Uh, so this is available um, on a number of our printers, even one of the desktops. Uh, it is not available on the, the J750 yet. The, I'm not sure about the J8 series. 
Um, so you, this will be in the Connexes or one of the desktop polyjets. Um, this is another one that has uh, short-term contact with skin, uh, 24 hour or one day contact with mucous membranes. And it is clear material and there's a little picture of it to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, another material I wanted to mention is our Agilis. It is a very flexible material. It simulates the characteristics of rubber. Um, it is the highest elongation at break and highest tensile, highest tear resistance on any of our flexible materials. So kind of a cool one to have in your back pocket if you need that. Let's take a look at and talk a little bit about the digital anatomy printer. Um, Stratasys technologies are being used to create realistic anatomical models. So this is, this is what the DAP or the digital anatomy printer was brought around. Um, these uh, anatomical models let researchers, engineers, and scientists, and physicians to collaborate and assist device performance in very clinical, relevant, and realistic ways. I had to write that down so I could get through that one. Uh, Multi-material models can mimic the tissue properties of various anatomy. The models can be customized to test devices against a range of clinical scenarios and to stress to test devices at the limits of their expected, uh, expected use cases. There are um, some reasons to be using a, a 3D printer to do this sort of thing. And 100% is the, pace, the patient pathology. You know, there's other ways to manufacture um, anatomical models, but nothing is going to give you 100% accurate representation of your own anatomy than the DAP printer can. Uh, the DAP printer is based on the J7 platform. You know, it's that's going to be built from that. Um, there is an upgrade path, so if you're a hospital and you already have one of these printers, uh, J750, you can get an upgrade to it. Uh, and what this brings to you, besides some software enhancements, is the tissue matrix, the gel matrix, and the bone matrix, which I had talked about a little bit before. Uh, and there is an example of one of the anatomy models. I believe this is a heart. Uh, and it looks like they have some, some devices in on it and they have some, I think that's the suture, the tape for sewing it up. So uh, something that is suturable, so something, something to practice there. So some business issues and medical applications. Uh, if you were traditionally using cadavers uh, to do medical testing with your devices, um, they're expensive. Uh, and I have a price breakdown on the next page to, to walk through a little bit. Um, Animal cadavers are not accurate to true human anatomy, and there is a scarcity of specimens. You know, they're they're a one-time use. Um, silicone molding, we said, is accurate, but is not going to simulate true patient's unique anatomy just based on the process that we have to use to to manufacture that. With those uh, traditionally made, uh, you know, molded parts, there's a lack of tactile. Realism, you know, there's not a, a response to your tools and how you're using them. Um, there is a, a lack of mobility, you know, being able to train wherever we want to. If we're using a cadaver, we have to be in a specific uh, uh, a specific facility that's certified to handle that and let us work on that. And there's a limited variation. You know, we're not going to find um, a special silicone mold for you know an infant or el an el elderly person. So here's the cost savings on, on, on just on the cadaver side. So uh, we have rental of the license, specialized license facility, uh, anesthesia, hazardous waste disposal in a humane and respectful manner, uh, a licensed technician, which is a, a law requirement, scrub attire, uh, protective articles to prevent the disease, um, surgery instrument tray rental, sterilization, repacking. Uh, you can't use... Um, tools on a cadaver that you could use on an actual person. So they've got to be dedicated to that. Um, and uh, some anatomy to train on. So uh, down here we have a price for a head for a human cadaver is $1,000 and up to $10,000 for, uh, I'm assuming, a whole one where we're only going to use parts of it to do our, our testing on. Okay. Uh, going down the printed side, you know, there's no special place we have to do our testing or training on uh, surgical testing, surgical trials. We don't have to be anywhere specific. We don't have to have special scrub attire, uh, no licensed technician, you know, no hazardous waste disposal. So looking across the bottom, you know, if we're going for the cheap side and just grabbing a head from our, our cadaver, 
uh, we're looking at 7,650 hours, or I'm sorry, $7,650 for two hours. And then for an animal, $8,800 for two hours. And we're looking at two animals and we priced in two young, healthy baby sheep. Comparing to a 3D printed model of um, $1 to $2,000 total. So looking at the, the materials that kind of that give us this the ability to do this is uh, one of those is tissue matrix. Tissue matrix is the softest 3D printing material available on any machine. Uh, it's down to the shore triple knot, I think is how we say that, um, which is way, way lower than uh, the shore A values that, we're, that I'm used to dealing with as far as talking about flexible materials. Um, and we can blend that with other rigid materials to get different hardnesses and different durometers. So a heart or an organ would be 7 to 12% of this tissue matrix blended together with something more um, rigid. This material is best used for hearts, organs, nerves, vessels, and bone marrow. Uh, sometimes the bone marrow inside of skeletal features. The bone matrix material is, you know, what it's, it is what it sounds like it is, is best used for any bone structure. Uh, anytime we talk about the spinal column, hip, shoulder socket, this, this will be built out of the bone matrix. The gel matrix is what makes the, uh, the printing of blood vessels possible. It is a very soft gel-like support material easy, for easy removal on, on large blood vessels. Uh, they, there's, a, there's a couple of pictures, I think, later on, and they to clean out the support structure. You know, anytime we have a a overhang on our model. So think about a sideways tube as a, in our um, in our blood vessel. That support's got to be removed out of there. And with the gel matrix, with the printed blood vessels, they're able to hook up a water circulation pump and actually pump water through to flush out the support material. So uh, kind of cool that they've made it soft enough to be just kind of rinsed away with water. So uh, another side of the, the the big possibilities with the digital anatomy printer is the software side. Um, now, if you're familiar with uh, some of our FDM printers and some of our Connexes in the J-Series, we use GrabCAD Print, and this is what certifies, you know, the Pantone colors. Uh, GrabCAD Print has the ability with the digital anatomy add-in to identify bodies within our, our files that we're printing and just identify what it is, and the software will build it to the durometers and hardnesses that it has built into it. You know, up to this point, we have you know over a hundred different presets, and I, I have a little video of the workflow. I'll show you. Uh, it is just pick your model, pick the tissue, pick you know if it's diseased or if it's hardened, you know whatever you need it to be. So here we have um, some general soft tissues, uh, tumors, myocardium, calcifications, leaflets, tumors, blood clots, blood vessels. Um, the blood, blood vessels, and you can see there's the uh, there's a blood vessel model. Uh, it does have the printed frame, so we're able to do a rigid material along with the soft vessels, and the rigid frame holds those vessels, you know, as they were inside of the actual scanned body or the uh, scan body. Um, we have the ability to choose calcifications and aneurysms in the blood vessels within the skeletal muscular system identifying vertebrae, ligaments, uh, nerve roots, skulls, and just general bone structures. So you can just pick on it, say what it is, and uh, the software will fill in the rest. All right, so a little bit on the workflow. Uh, so what we're printing is actually a, uh, a collection from an MRI or CD scan. So those usually come out as, as DICAM, DICOM files. And using those slices of the body, you know, from the scan, we're using a third-party software. Um, off the top of my head, there's one uh, software package called Materialize Mimics. You know, we can work with them and you if you so this is a something that you want to look at. Uh, there's a couple open source ones out there that I've messed around with a little bit, but I think the big one is going to be Mimics. Once the software has gone through, done its thing, and the, the operator has uh, made any changes or tweaks that they need to make, the assembly or the specific organs that you need to print can be sent over to GrabCAD. You know, over there, we'll sign the preset tissues, bone, diseases, et cetera. And then from there, we'll send it to the, the, the DAP printer. So here is uh, a little bit of the workflow. And I'll let it cycle through a few times because um, the recording went a little fast. 
So I'm hoping that it comes through okay. So in this case, they chose a heart. Um, they can change the hardness on it. And uh, you can see like uh, there's a, the annulus with the flexibility setting. So each one that has something adjustable and adjustable property to it, you can choose and go through that. So I'll let it play through one more time. Um, so it's just a different mode that the printer will use. And it's, it is available only to the, the DAP printer. Go through a couple samples and some use cases here at the end. Um, here's a picture of a femur bone. Uh, you can see that the gel matrix material on the inside where the where the inside of the bone will be and then the bone matrix material on the outside. And you can see that it's built the structure of a bone based on that MRI data. Here's a spinal column segment with a looks like a couple of screws going in. So maybe maybe surgical testing, planning, that sort of thing. Um, the tissue matrix material is the, the um, the disc in there, and then the, the bone matrix is the, the vertebrae themselves. Cartilage there is what they're calling that. Here we have some sinus and soft palate educational prints. These are for training uh, at a school. Um, it's meant to show the sinus cavities around the eyes, the soft palate, uh, as an educational guide for surgeons uh, and physicians in ear, nose, and throat medicine. So uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you, you have an assembly basically here is you can assemble this together. You can kind of see the outside here is assemble snaps to the back and then that goes into a mannequin. So somebody can practice on this surgery. So whatever they're doing in here in the sinuses, they can practice on it with, you know, true, true uh, patient anatomy. Uh, so this, this is going to take a little bit of an explanation, and I almost removed this, but uh, after reading through some of the notes, I, I saved it because of uh, how powerful these pictures are. Um, and what this is actually showing us is three different models. So these were 3D printed, and then uh, an x-ray was taken of those. So what they were doing is they were, they were going through... Um, uh, developing uh, neurovascular models to test the image image guided deployment of stint retrievers. So they're um, they're deploying these retrievers to to um, grab the stint out after the uh, blockage is gone. So on the first image there on the left, you see a branch of this artery is actually clogged, and you should see over here on the right hand side of this image, you should see a dark area where there's blood flowing or in this case, whatever they were pumping through this. All right, so there, there shows where the, the blood clot was at. Here you can see the device is being deployed and tested. And then here you can see, you know, this is the same artery as this first image. And here that right-hand passage on this artery is freed up, right? So this is post-operation from the actual patient. They did another scan and printed out their model and they were able to look and say here that the the surgery in this case was only um, partially successful. That that uh, blockage had actually worked its way down into a, a smaller artery, and you can kind of see that with the arrow pointing to it. And this is valuable feedback from this device. In reviewing the use of models for surgical planning, we found three primary categories of use. And as you move from planning to practice to determining, um, greater clinical and economic impact is realized. At the first level, at the first level, physicians are using 3D models to plan an optimal approach. You know, perhaps even identifying an alternative path that they had not considered that minimizes invasiveness of the, the the procedure, resulting in a faster recovery. Physicians could do some of this planning on a computer model on a 2D screen, but you can't compare that to holding something you know real real life you know real size out of uh, out of material that mimics the human body so well. Um, or, you know, we can actually uh, increase the size so we can scale up the parts. So being able to look at something, you know, something that would normally be, you know, too small to see, we can blow it up and look at it. Uh, some physicians have started practicing procedures on patient-specific models. This gives them an opportunity to refine their technique. Uh, this makes errors on the 3D model rather than the patient. In some instances, physicians have been able to determine if a certain device would or would not work, or if a patient was an appropriate candidate for a surgery. 
only after interacting with the 3D model and on avoiding unnecessary intervention or discovering an approach that was not seen on the computer screen can have a significant clinical and financial benefit. So I have a few uh, customer stories. Um, these are not necessarily related to DAP, the digital anatomy printer, but just any, any medical use case that had uh, meaningful meaning to me. Um, so Emma, uh, you can see a picture of Emma. She was born with arthro, arthrogryposis. Uh, it's a defect that causes joint contractions as well as shortening of the tendons. So she basically didn't have the ability to move her, her arms. Um, she didn't have the ability, her muscles weren't developed enough to move her arms. Um, uh, a doctor used a, an adult, uh, basically exoskeleton and modeled it and was able to scale it down and print it out for Emma. Um, he, you can see here that there's these little pegs on the joints and he would put rubber bands on that to give her the ability to move her arms. Um, in this case, uh, 3D printing allowed this uh, doctor, uh, as it say here, Dr. Redmond Burke, uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital to replicate his patient's unique pathology. Um, I believe her name was Mia. It doesn't say down here in the notes, but I'm pretty sure it's a Mia on this one. Um, so he used the 3D printing to create a, a really accurate anatomical model for an operation. Um, he discovered that she was uh, a candidate for an operation, how before having the model of her heart in his hand had been inoperable, being able to, to save somebody's life. Sorry, I clicked ahead too fast on that one. Um, some more medical applications, so rapid prototyping. Um, this company is, I believe it's pronounced Psych Medical. Uh, they create um, medical devices that uh, solve an unmet challenge. Uh, they needed a delivery system to enable uh, patients suffering from pain to have a precisely controlled dose of, of pain medication uh, for relief and avoiding unnecessary physical reactions. So getting just the right amount of material or the right amount of medicine they need at a, any given point. Um, their solution was an object 350 Connex 3 printer. So multiple materials at a time being, um, they were able to um, 3D print almost 80% of their prototype, had a, a successful clinical trial with it and was ready for commercial production shortly thereafter. Uh, they were able to iterate designs quickly and faster than they'd ever have done that before. And I love this quote up here from um, uh, Perry Davidson, is our motto at Psych is don't think, just to print it. Uh, cardiovascular Systems Incorporated, incorpor incorporated CSI, uh, is a mid-sized medical device company. Uh, they're developing solutions for coronary artery disease. So their challenge was the, being able to simulate complex anatomical models, such as soft tissue and vessels, and hard calcifications within the same prototyping model. Now, I believe that these guys had a connex. We, you know, we can do clears and we can do um, flexible materials with the agilis on the connexes, but um, with a step up into the, the uh, digital anatomy printer, we could actually do a true to life uh, tactile feedback with the, the um, tissue matrix material. Arch Day Design is another medical device manufacturer. Um, they specialize in minimally invasive devices. Uh, they had a, a prototyping challenge that, you know, sending parts to get printed at a, a service bureau had a high um, cost, a long turnaround time. And, you know, of course, if you're prototyping, you're sending your, your, your um, intellectual property out to somebody else. Um, so they took their prototyping down, bringing the printing in-house, brought their prototyping down from, you know, iteration to iteration from three days to a matter of hours. And definitely save them on the outsourcing cost. Uh, this is the Center for Biomedical and Technology Integration, CBMTI. Uh, to enhance neurosurgery, uh, they print out, uh, you can kind of see the head. So they have a bone, they got a bone matrix, they have the tissue matrix, um, and they're also printing out jigs and fixtures. So I believe the fixture here. Uh, the end of it's printed and they're using that to drill drill a hole. So being able to practice that ahead of time. And this is the last story and I threw this one in here because, you know, I come from a manufacturing background and this is definitely, a, you know, a manufacturing alley. 
is uh, this, you can see that little mesh here on this mold, on this forming mold. And this is for a orbital implant. So uh, we're taking this mesh and we're using a, a printed part. So um, it looks like a polyjet mold from what I can tell. And they're using the two halves to not only form the mesh to you know true specific patient anatomy, but they're also using it to trim with. So there, there's a, a scribe line in there to print uh, to print with. So a an implant, you know, we're using one of our, our printed parts as a tool to to do an implant. Which right now, um, Stratasys doesn't have the ability to do implants. You know, we can do as we said a short term contact with the skin and mucous membranes, but nothing is implantable. Um, and that, my friends, is all I have on um, on that. You know, there's lots and lots of customer stories out there.